fucking good. All you'll ever be. As soon as the Lemleys were ousted at Universal in 1936, the new head of production, Charles Rogers, immediately cancelled all planned horror projects following Dracula's Daughter, which had already wrapped at the time. Rogers' tenure at Universal would prove unremarkable though, and he was replaced just two years into his reign with Cliff Work, who was determined to get the studio back in the black for the first time since 1931. Meanwhile, in August of 1938, the Regina Wilshire Theater in LA, for a bargain 99 total dollars, rented the prints of three older pictures, Son of Kong, Dracula, and Frankenstein. The plan was to have a four-day run of the triple feature, but on opening night, the crowd was so enormous that the police had to be called in to help manage it. The show proved so successful that the manager at the time, the visionary Emil Uman, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right, extended it for four weeks, dropped Son of Kong at some point, and hired a desperate and out-of-work Bela Lugosi to do in-the-flesh promotion. Universal, jealous of the windfall the theater was getting, then started a run of its own, ordering multiple reprints of Dracula and Frankenstein to send to more theaters at a freshly jacked-up price keeping Lugosi employed as a touring promoter, and having a very successful double feature that garnered the attention of the new regime at Universal. Cliff Work then looked on the shelf at the cancelled horror projects from 1936, and I can only assume a light bulb shattered over his head. Knowing a good bet when he saw one, Work got to work, and the Universal classic monsters were brought back from the dead. The Baron Wolfgang von Frankenstein, progeny of the infamous Dr. Henry Frankenstein, has come with his wife and young child to claim his inheritance. An empty castle, a half-destroyed laboratory, and a townsfolk who have nothing but contempt for his name. Wolf aims to repair his family's reputation, and when he discovers the still-breathing body of Frankenstein's monster, he concludes that waking the beast is the only way to advance the twisted science begun by his late father. But lurking in the shadows is a killer, all too eager to make the monster his marionette of murder. After briefly entertaining the idea to remake some horror properties like The Old Dark House and The Raven, Universal ultimately began its horror rebirth with a brand new Frankenstein, initially announced under the title After Frankenstein. The studio wanted to strike while the iron was hot, and rushed it into production without a director, even after rejecting the original screenplay turned in by radio veteran Willis Cooper. Production was supposed to start in mid-October, though, so they decided to use Cooper's unpolished script to begin the casting process. Eventually, they brought in the workhorse director Rowland V. Lee, who reworked the script, sometimes with Cooper's help and sometimes without it, and tried to get the studio to delay the start of filming as much as possible. An impatient Universal demanded he get started by early November, though, as the cast and crew were getting paid even if cameras weren't rolling. It also handed down several other mandates that Lee was inclined to ignore. But he couldn't delay, so with only half a script in hand and the studio already upset at him for costing it money, Lee started shooting Son of Frankenstein. Hey, do you have a sci-fi classic you want me to cover? Drop it down in the comments below, and while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you'd like to support what I do even more, please consider joining my Patreon to get access to bonus content, vote on future topics, and more. If you still haven't gotten enough of me, I'm also the co-host of a couple of different podcasts, The Streaming Heap and From Here to Paternity, which are available wherever you get your podcasts, and I have a novel called Paradox that is available through Amazon. If all else fails, though, you can always check out my website at emcgill.com, where you'll find written reviews of plenty more science fiction classics in both film and literature. Now then, with all that shameless self-promotion out of the way, let's move on. As early as late August 1938, when Dracula and Frankenstein were raking in the dough across the West Coast, Universal started inking a two-picture deal with Boris Karloff, 
with one of those pictures being a Frankenstein sequel. Karloff was wary of the part, given the physical toll it took, but thanks to his poor treatment at Warner Brothers, he knew he needed to don the costume and makeup one more time, lest his career languish into an endless stream of radio shows and unenthusiastic pictures. Karloff did make one request to the director, however, and that was to remove the monster's dialogue from the script. He'd never liked the inclusion of the monster's speech in Bride of Frankenstein, feeling that it took away from the power of the character. And so the Son of Frankenstein script was reworked to give a plausible reason for the monster to regress back to a mute. The other actor cast in the early days, before his role had even been created, was Bela Lugosi. If Karloff was facing career difficulties, they paled in comparison to Lugosi's. Lugosi hadn't been in a single movie in years, not counting a serial in 1937. He'd had to turn to the Motion Picture Relief Fund to pay for the hospital visit in which his firstborn son entered the world. He was behind on guild payments, his house had been foreclosed on, and even his dogs had been threatened with termination after one of them got loose and attacked a neighbor. What music they make. With Son of Frankenstein, Universal may have given Lugosi an acting job, but the studio did not treat Bela as kindly as they did Boris. He was given a pittance by comparison, and Lee was under orders to keep his role small and to make sure the actor only worked for one week at his paltry salary. Luckily for Lugosi, Lee, furious at the studio's cruel attitude, not only kept Lugosi working throughout the entire shoot, but he also created the role of Igor specifically for the actor. In return for this generosity, Lugosi turned in what might just be the best performance of his entire career. You mean to say that if he commits another crime that he can't be hanged again? I do nothing. I hear Frankenstein. He's a good man. He paid me money. As for the titular son of Frankenstein, the Baron Wolfgang von Frankenstein, the studio courted both Peter Lorre and Claude Rains. But after they turned it down, Lee himself suggested Basil Rathbone, who he'd worked with on the previous year's Love from a Stranger. Despite not being a fan of horror pictures, Rathbone adds a touch of class to the whole production, even earning top billing and a heftier paycheck over Karloff. Personally, I love Rathbone's Frankenstein, a hopelessly naive and optimistic man who only wants to prove his father's worth as he finds himself in a situation suddenly spiraling out of control, ensnared by his own unconvincing lies and foolish faith. My father drew that very lightning from heaven and forced it to his own will. Why should we fear anything? The other great character in this film is Inspector Croch, played with relish by Lionel Atwill. He's the perfect foil for Dr. Frankenstein, even if he takes a bit too long to assemble the clues placed at his feet throughout the story. The bit with him having to manually move his prosthetic arm would later be parodied in Dr. Strangelove. Other notable actors include Josephine Hutchinson as the Baron's wife Elsa, the original film's Burgomaster Lionel Belmore as Emil Lang, one of the monster's victims, Emma Dunn as Amelia, and Donnie Dunnigan as the young Peter von Frankenstein. That brings me to the delicate subject of the child actor turning in a dreadful performance. Donnie, or should I say Major Donald Dunnigan, is a retired Marine now, so he can probably take the criticism, which I stress is not really directed at him, since he was just a child in 1938. However, every scene with the grandson of Frankenstein is just painful to watch, because, man, just, just see for yourself. How do you do, sir? I, you're not supposed to shake hands with our left hand. Peter. Oh, I'm sorry, that was very, very rude of me. Filming lasted all the way into the early days of 1939, just eight days before it was released, with a budget that had ballooned from an initial $250,000 to well over $400,000. The studio, and Cliff Work in particular, were furious with Lee for obvious reasons, vowing to only hire B-picture directors and yes-men to direct future horror films at Universal. One fun Hollywood anecdote from Son of Frankenstein 
came when Boris Karloff, not stopping to remove his makeup, rushed to the hospital as his wife gave birth to his first child on the actor's own birthday. When Karloff entered the hospital, still dressed as Frankenstein's monster, it was a sight few people could forget. Upon returning to the film set the following day, Rathbone and Lagoshi, who you'll remember also recently had his first kid, celebrated with a big cake and a lot of good cheer, no doubt costing the studio more time and money. Despite the rocky production and truncated post-production, Son of Frankenstein became a massive hit, raking in over $900,000 in theater rentals, making it the most profitable first run of any of the Universal Classic Monster movies. Even the critics were kind to it, knowing not to bet against the phenomenon of Universal Horror, a phenomenon that was proving more popular than ever, and as promised, Cliff Work oversaw Universal Studios entering the black for the first time in nearly a decade. As such, the legacy of the film is obvious. It revived an entire franchise, sparking a new round of sequels to several of the big names, including a few more Frankenstein pictures, albeit without Karloff. Though it is tempting to put all the weight of the success on Son of Frankenstein, you do have to give credit to that tentative triple feature the previous year, because without that, the studio might not have ever returned to form. As for me, I do think Son of Frankenstein gets too often forgotten beside its two predecessors. It retains the gothic horror of the original Frankenstein, and like its first sequel, it keeps its characters very colorful. But it also adds in some German expressionism, a more methodical sense of dread, and it features a climax in which Sherlock Holmes swing kicks Frankenstein's monster into a pit of boiling sulfur. As mentioned, it's got great performances from Lagoshi, Rathbone, and Atwill, each of which steals the spotlight from Karloff throughout. Of all the Frankenstein sequels, I gotta admit this one is my favorite, and you shouldn't need me to tell you that it is, obviously, a horror classic. And that's all for today, my dear mortals. What's your favorite Bela Lugosi performance? Let me know in the comments, and while you're there, hit that like and subscribe, or else I'll sick his devil dogs on you. Thank you for watching, and until next time when a simple bit of company theft will be rudely interrupted by a serial killer, this is the Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love. As long as you're not going to revive an undead monstrosity. Settled. You were hanged and pronounced dead.